Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Paytech Show. In this episode, we learn all about SCA or strong customer authentication. So to find out how it's going to affect consumers, banks and the industry as a whole, we went to the European Banking Authority or the EBA to find out more. Because of Brexit, the EBA has now moved to Paris. So we're here in La Défense to find out more about SCA. Primarily two reasons why strong customer authentication was introduced into the revised payment service directive in the European Union. The first one had to do with attempt to mitigate the increased fraud levels across the European Union that we have seen in recent years. And strong customer authentication is one of the major standards on how security uh, requirements in payment services can be uh, enhanced. Another reason was that uh, the PSD2 also introduced open banking, so the uh, access to payment accounts uh, by third party providers which uh, was an initiative in order to enhance competition in payment services uh, across the EU and to facilitate innovation and that should be done in a way that allows every user and every provider in, in the payments market to have confidence into this new innovation. For those two reasons, payment fraud uh, combating generally and uh, ensuring that there is a payment market in place uh, in which everyone can have confidence even once uh, open banking has been introduced, strong customer authentication was uh, included in the revised payment service directive in order to lay the groundwork for uh, enhanced security. SEA stands for strong customer authentication and means that a payment service provider when providing payment services needs to use two-factor authentication, i.e. needs to use two out of three authentication factors which are defined as knowledge, i.e. something only the user knows, possession, something only the user has, and inheritance, something only the user is. Next up, we went to Munich to hear from Gieske and Devron, a financial services company with over 160 years worth of experience to find out how the industry has taken to the regulation. Let's talk about strong customer authentication. What's been the, um, the reaction and the effect of this so far? First of all, the, uh, it is a difficult when the uh, regulator says that, uh, that you need to do certain things, then they start to regulate that how do you do, to do things technically, but then they still leave some holes, let's say, in this one. And there is a lot of interpretations. And you have seen that uh, many of the banks were more kind of on the waiting mode. Okay, we need to see how this goes forward. And then when the, actually the uh, date of the 14th September hit, uh, many of the banks were not ready. And uh, then in most of the countries, I guess, uh, is Sweden the only one who didn't actually ask for the waiver or extension, so all the other countries did. Uh, and that means that, uh, well, there is still a long way to go. Uh, because now the banks need to see that, okay, how do I do it? I have a personal experience, for example, that uh, some of the banks, they did it really in a way which, yes, complies with their uh, PSD2 requirements for the strong authentication. And it, in a way, I can feel that, okay, it gives me a certain assurance that, okay, there must be now something secure uh, because uh, you need to have, a, for example, a secondary uh, password and you need to do that. But if you need to do, start doing things like this at the point of sales payment, so I mean, forget it. So people don't use it, uh, they, then they, they start using something else. So I think that uh, now it is the time uh, for banks to really kind of look, how shall we do it? And of course, the best would be that there is some harmonization, which might be difficult because there, there is a, not a good body, in my opinion, who could, uh, let's say, uh, work on the harmonization. Because if the user experience for you or me is different, or if it's a different when I use my, let's say, Apple Pay, or I do my other wallet, or I do my, my card-based uh, contactless payment, so uh, consumers get confused. And that's the last thing that you want to have. Interesting, because culturally, banks are often fast followers. Then they're very often the first to kind of step in. Do you think culturally there was an element of waiting to see what other people do, how they handle it? I think so. Well, that's actually our experience. So when we discuss some of the banks, so they say that, well, we are good enough. We have this kind of SMS OTP and then uh, you are saying that, well, maybe that's not secure enough. Then they said, well, uh, could be, but uh, we see what the regulator said. Uh, we see what the other, for example, the local banking authority says, and then we see what the other banks might do in other countries. So yes, absolutely. Uh, and whether that's a good, good or not, maybe is, is that. 
I always believe that this, this is also the momentum for uh, any industry, but now here in the banks, when the new regulation comes, that you can differentiate yourself. Do it proactively, do it that it's a secure, you comply, but uh, be innovative enough that it's also good user experience and that there is an added value maybe for the merchant too, because they, they are struggling with these things usually, uh, whether it's an online or, or physical merchant. That's all well and good, but we wanted to see how the financial institutions were actually untangling the regulation. So Ali Patterson flew to Milan to speak with European banking giants Unicredit. On the subject of strong customer authentication, how, uh, how ready is Unicredit? We, we serve 25 million customers and I'm happy to confirm that institutionally wise we, are, we were ready uh, on time on 14th of September. In many of the locations we were even ready before. I mean in July, in some of the key locations we were ready in July as well uh, to support the, the regulatory side and adhering one single uh, SCA for the entire uh, type of customers in the group. Therefore, uh, enabling the strictest method to be applied for all of our customers and giving the various channels that we are having, either in retail or in corporate. Do you have any uh, examples of where you've seen a bank take on board strong customer authentication in a very proactive way? I think that yes, there has been, um, but um, how successful they are, so that, that's a difficult to say um, because it's uh, early days, those implementations are rather new. I, I wouldn't name any, but yes, I know a few banks who have done pretty kind of a sophisticated implementation. I mean, it's a very strong authentication. They use even a kind of a, not just a two, but maybe three form factors. Uh, and, uh, but it's still uh, all embedded basically that, uh, for example, if you use the mobile, so that's it's a biometric base. So you don't need to uh, manage, you just do it intuitively as a consumer. So yes, I think there are. Uh, but uh, again, I cannot say that, okay, are they more successful than the others? Uh, are you gaining more customers or anything like this? But at least what they have uh, received the feedback from the consumer is that uh, they are good with that. So, which is already, I guess, an achievement. Gieske and Devron, or G&D, have partnered with numerous banks to help them achieve compliance with the regulation. So Ali asked Yuka all about the Convego mobile hub and how it helps banks actually achieve this compliance. Our Convigo Hub is basically a platform uh, which enables banks but also different kind of uh, other uh, actors in the ecosystem to plug in uh, to the, let's say, the digitized payment uh, uh, systems. So what it is in brief is that uh, we have built uh, platforms which connects to multiple uh, token uh, service providers like Visa, BTS, Mastercard, MDES. Uh, we do that in Germany for Gyrocard, we do that in India for Rupee and so forth. And what it means for a bank basically, if they want their uh, cards to be digitized, so they can just uh, connect to us with the single connection and then they can have all the different schemes services available. Um, but at the same time, as I said, there are other actors. So there are organizations, let's say like uh, we provided this summer or launched the service for LG, for LG Pay. So when LG device user wants to have their cards digitized, they use the LG wallet on their LG device. And this goes actually up to our systems, which is then connected further uh, to the Visa MasterCard. And we can then ask the token on uh, behalf of the LG. Once the bank approves that digitization, we get the token, we deliver that to the LG device. But we do that uh, same for the automotive industry now, wearable industry. And uh, the big thing is, of course, what is happening is, is on, in the online uh, a space where basically the online merchants or, uh, will now have a lot of cards already uh, in their databases, so-called card on file. Uh, so when you log in to the website, you enter your card numbers, there is a box that you tick saying that you want to save your card information, then your card information will be stored. But then it's of course a very uh, unsecure because uh, if that database is compromised, then 
the card information is uh, gone and it's a big issue of course of an emergent because you cannot uh, anymore uh, do the payment because there is no card to make the payment and it's an issue for the issuer because you need to renew the cards because they are compromised. But uh, tokenizing those uh, where we can help for example the merchants that they connect again to us, we have all the schemes available, uh, they can basically have then the tokens and that uh, increases the security and there is a lot of other user good use user experience improvements as well. So this is basically what we provide on the Convigo Hub. So it's, it's a really of course for the banks because they are uh, finally issuing the cards. So there is an integration point in the service and then different type of uh, organization devices who want to request the tokens to be on their uh, let's say endpoint. Excellent. It's almost like you're the um you're the airport board, you're the, uh, the terminal in the airport as opposed to the planes themselves. Uh, basically yes, so it's a kind of a one door that you go to the airport and then there is a lot of uh, gates that you can take uh, yourself so and you don't need to know uh, which gates there are uh, if you just go in, so absolutely yes. A regulation is nothing if the industry and the banks don't share in the same goals as the regulator. So I wanted to ask Dirk over at the EBA what his views of the regulation was and ultimately how the institutions can share in the same spirit of that regulation. I think a key lesson learned for the industry but also for us as regulatory authorities is that um, a directive such as the Payment Service Directive as well as the technical standards that the EBA has developed in support of the directive um, stay at a relatively high level when it comes to the level of detail uh, in respect of security requirements for payment transactions. And that is done deliberately so because one of the key objectives that the directive has as well as that the EBA has is to stay business model neutral and to stay technology neutral. So we are not in the business of favoring uh, or prescribing one particular technology or one particular business model and one particular type of provider. We want to enhance competition, we want to facilitate innovation. So the, uh, the spirit of the directive of the, uh, of the PSD2 in terms, in terms of security uh, uh, enhancements are pretty clear. So when we leave in our, uh, in our requirements in the directive or the technical standards some room for interpretation deliberately so, so that firms can innovate and our technical standards do not need to be updated every two years in order to keep track with the innovations in the market, then the firms should not interpret that as um, an opportunity to somehow game the requirements. If in doubt whether something is compliant or not, they should also not wait until the regulator has come up with a view. They should stay on the safe side and make sure that they do comply with the spirit of the requirements as well. Because only that allows the regulator to continue staying at a high level with the requirements and allow and give the breathing space for the industry to actually innovate and develop, continue to develop uh, solutions without us as a regulator prescribing exactly what is and is not compliant. The spirit of the, of, of the regulation for me is exactly that fostering collaboration. As such, obviously we want to tick the boxes, we want to be strong in customer authentication, have good APIs and blah blah blah, whatever. At the same time it's not enough, it's definitely not enough. We believe at Unicredit that serving our clients from retail to corporates in a frank, honest and fair manner is exactly what they want and that's why they would continue to bank with us. We believe that this innovation is really important for the market, but also for our clients and for ourselves. And we believe we cannot do everything by ourselves, or even the will, and so we need basically to partner rightly with others, call it fintechs, other banks, whatever. Therefore, it is for us critical that we move to the next step, understand the spirit of the initial and the end game of that regulation, embrace it, and play it fairly, to the end. That's exactly what we want to do, but certainly not the tick-the-box exercise. We take it very seriously. So how do you think SCA is really going to make European payments and the European industry set itself apart from other geographies? I think one of the uh, key features of SCA in combination, in particular in combination with uh, account access, so open banking, is that the European Union is the only jurisdiction in, in the world that is developing security requirements and open banking requirements that allow third-party providers to access payment accounts by banks in a very, very secure way. 
uh, to the highest security standard that we that we can develop. Uh, this is unique, and uh, no one else in the world is uh, is is going down that path at the moment. We of course are aware, and we know of various jurisdictions that uh, have uh, uh, voluntary agreements with the uh, with the industry in order to open up uh, banking accounts and for others then to uh, uh, to access those those accounts. But to actually to prescribe it in the, in the way we are doing it uh, uh, here in the European Union is quite unique, and we are doing it across 28 different countries rather than just one country. So that is quite a unique feature, it creates lots of challenges um, uh, also for us as a regulator because we need to be uh, mindful of the fact that we do not want to over-prescribe and over-regulate, something that is meant to um, facilitate innovation. But it is a uh, very, very interesting and very uh, uh, productive way of allowing competition in a market that hopefully convinces the incumbents of the, um, of the merits and the benefits and the opportunities that these new services will bring for them as well, and not only for the, the, the new market entrants, the new market challenges. So the European Union, in, in our sense, of course, we have a, bi a biased view as a European Union institution, the EBA, but the European Union leads the way uh, uh, in this respect globally. Um, but the jury is still out uh, to see whether we are going to be ultimately successful. So far, uh, we are very confident that we are on the right track. Thanks for watching this week's episode of The Paytech Show. I hope you've enjoyed the European adventure into strong customer authentication and hope to catch you next time. Ciao.